Happy birthday, Anna Magdalena. Who was Anna Magdalena Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach's beloved wife? Well, we do not have much certain knowledge because the records from which research can reconstruct the biography of Thomas Cantor's Bach's loved one offer very little information. Most meaningful documents are long gone. Private correspondence from relevant persons that could bring us closer to her are extremely rare. Not even a picture of her exists. The only relatively large-sized portrait of her by a painter named Cristofori, which once must have existed, has disappeared. And so, the few surviving sources that can provide us with certain knowledge indicate one thing above all else, a big gap that we much must fill with more or less plausible conjectures, which is to say, life. However, whether or not a real step forward is still possible from our current research situation is difficult to assess. The Bach Archive in Leipzig has been collecting historical sources for many years, especially those related to the biography of Anna Magdalena Bach and her daughters, and attempting to pursue the nearly vanished traces of Bach's second wife. And even though we do not know much, we do know, at least, that she was not just Bach's wife and the mother of 13 children, but also a reliable copyist and herself a musician, a passable harpsichordist, and above all else, an excellent and celebrated singer, who was at the beginning of a brilliant career when she became Bach's second wife. But let's start from the beginning. Anna Magdalena Wilke was born on the 22nd of September, 1701, as the daughter of the Zeitst court trumpeter Johann Kaspar Wilke and his wife, Margarete Elisabeth. Both her paternal and maternal grandfathers had also worked as musicians. Anna Magdalena and her four sisters and brother grew up in a very musical environment. Her father came from a long line of court trumpeters, and according to his expectations and craft, his son later took up this profession, and three of the daughters in turn married with court trumpeters. Her mother came from a widely spread out family of organists in Thuringia and Saxony, and was probably also musically educated. And so it was almost inevitable that Anna Magdalena came into contact with music early on. And as it turns out, her beautiful voice and musical talent was soon noticed in the circle of court musicians in sights and promoted accordingly. Insights, one of the three small secondary courts in Saxony, founded around the middle of the 17th century, the lights literally went out around 715. The Ducal Court had long been doling out more money than it had been making through taxes from its territory. And the debt accumulated over the course of seven decades forced the Duke to drastically limit his expenses. First to be affected were the members of the court orchestra and the trumpeters, who were mainly used for representative purposes. At the beginning of 1718, Johann Kaspar Wilke sold his house near Moritzburg Castle and the cathedral on Messerschmiedestrasse and moved with his family to nearby Weissenfels. This move proved to be a stroke of luck for the 17-year-old Anna Magdalena because at the time the famous prima donna Christina Paulina Kellner was at the local court, with whom the young singer may then have studied. Paulina 
born in Stuttgart in 1664, looked back on one of the most brilliant careers that a German singer could experience in her time. She had sung in almost all German royal courts, was in demand as cantatrice in Ansbach, Bayreuth, Berlin, Kassel, and Wolfenbüttel, and could even boast of having had acclaimed opera performances in London. Anyway, it's clear that we can hardly overestimate Anna Magdalena's vocal qualities. The fact that she, as a 19-year-old, already performed with her father at the court in Anhalt Zerbst and later received one of the best-paid positions in the court orchestra in Köthen as a so-called chamber musician speaks for her extraordinary talent. Unfortunately, we lack information as to the exact repertoire Anna Magdalena mastered. But the comment that she sang, quote, in the chapel may refer to solo parts in larger ensemble works, e.g. arias from sacred cantatas or secular commemorative music. In Köthen, where Anna Magdalena had stayed since 1720, the nearly 20-year-old singer and the 35-year-old Kapellmeister, Bach, must have become close quickly, because they were already present together as the godparents at the baptism of the son of the royal cellar servant, Christian Hahn, on the 25th of September, 1721. And at that time, with the acceptance of mutual godparenthood, lovers or fiancés announced their intention to start a family soon themselves. Two months later, on the 3rd of December, 1721, Anna Magdalena Wilke and the widow widower Johann Sebastian Bach married. And until moving to Leipzig in 1723, where Johann Sebastian took over the position of Thomas Cantor, Anna Magdalena remained a married woman in the position of a chamber singer. The couple was thus a working couple, which at this time was an absolute exception. One can even assume that she performed all the demanding soprano arias composed by her husband in honor of the Curtin royal couple. For Anna Magdalena, it would not have been easy at the time, even still while in Curtin, to reconcile family life with that of a professional vocalist. The 20-year-old was suddenly confronted with the task of organizing a household in which four children from Bach's first marriage to Maria Barbara had been motherless for one and a half years. They were Katarina de Rotea, who at the age of 13 was just seven years younger than her new stepmother, 11-year-old Wilhelm Friedemann, 7-year-old Karl Philipp Emanuel, and Johann Gottfried Bernhard, one year younger. She also had to accommodate the unmarried, older sister of Bach's first wife, who had lived in Bach's household for many years. The 46-year-old Aunt Friedelena was significantly older than Anna Magdalena, and it is likely that she both supported and patronized the young woman. Anna Magdalena's short career ended, however, when Johann Sebastian left the position of Kapellmeister in small, cozy Curtin and took over the office of Thomas Kantor in the trading metropolis Leipzig. Although there was considerable musical at activity in Leipzig, Anna Magdalena didn't have any opportunities here. The Leipzig Opera had been closed in 1720, and women were not allowed to perform church music. It is also evident that women did not appear in public concerts in Leipzig until after 1750, not even on Anna Magdalena. But even if it had been socially possible for her to continue working as a singer, 
she would hardly have found the time to do so, for by 1742 she had given birth to 13 children. Along with constant pregnancies came the household chores, and apart from her children and husband, many of her husband's students and numerous guests from far and wide had to be cared for. According to a statement by Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, the second born from Johann Sebastian's first marriage, the apartment was like a dovecote. In addition to all this everyday stress, Anna Magdalena had to make sure that Bach found the necessary rest for his composing. She had to watch his back, so to say. Also, she copied much of Bach's music by hand, such as the famous cello suites. One wonders when she found the time for it, probably at night. One thing is certain, she must have had a tremendously exhausting life. How Anna Magdalena herself viewed the end of her career, and how she endured her life as a wife and mother are matters which we, once again, can only speculate about. For the Bach biographers, she was not relevant. And regardless of this, there are no extant documents such as personal letters that could provide information. A small passage in a letter from Johann Sebastian Bach to his classmate Georg Erdmann, dated the 28th of October, 1730, written during his time in Leipzig, indicates that there was often socializing in the Bach house, in the form of music-making, with which Anna Magdalena was involved. This letter says, But they are all born musicians, and I can assure you that I can already form an ensemble both, both vocaliter and instrumentaliter within my family, particularly since my present wife sings a good, clear soprano, and my eldest daughter, too, joins in not badly. Therefore, it may be rightly assumed that the clear soprano, Anna Magdalena, sang at private concerts in the official residence of the Thomas Cantor, as well as at other non-public events, which allowed for the participation of a female singer, such as birthday or wedding parties. In addition, a few journeys of Johann Sebastian Bach in the company of Anna Magdalena are documented, and it is explicitly stated that they, quote, let themselves be heard. Particularly noteworthy in this respect is a stay together in Kutten in March of 1729 on the occasion of the funeral for Prince Leopold, Bach's former employer and friend who had died the previous November. Bach probably adapted and arranged arias and chorales from pre-existing works for the composition of the funeral music, of which, however, we only have the libretto today. If this assumption is correct, then the former royal singer, singer Anna Magdalena Bach, sang three soprano arias with slightly altered text taken from the St. Matthew Passion, in which she was never allowed to participate in Leipzig at her former work place of work in Kürten. Another aspect of Anna Magdalena's musical and domestic life can be traced in the precious booklet with a green cover that Johann Sebastian gifted his wife in 1725. On the first 40 pages, Bach himself had copied two of his most demanding harpsichord pieces, suggesting that Anna Magdalena was not only a good singer, but probably also a very good harpsichordist. However, it is not certain that she was actually able to master the technical difficulties of these two compositions. Doubt that she herself played these challenging pieces arises when examining her own entries, which are mess much less demanding. However, in the following years, 
not only Anna Magdalena and Johann Sebastian, but also the children, tutor, and guests filled the remaining pages with small keyboard pieces, songs, and choral movements. The book the booklet was therefore not only musical edification for Anna Magdalena, but was also a lesson and exercise book for their children. It does not only document the relationship between the two sincerely married persons, but also represents a piece of family history. This makes it one of the few documents that gives us a little insight into the private law life of the Bach family. In addition to liveliness, this private family history also included death and grief. Especially in the second half of the 1720s and early 1730s, not only the births, but also the deaths piled up. Three of the 13 children born by Anna Magdalena did not even survive until their, birth, their first birthday. Four died in childhood. Only six survived their mother. And so the aria Schlummert ein ihr matten Augen, which can also be found in this little book, certainly did not only seldom correspond to Anna Magdalena's state of mind in many a difficult situation. When Bach died in 1750, there was no will left behind and little financial reserves for Anna Magdalena. In 1751, Anna Magdalena had to leave the official residence at the St. Thomas School. She found an apartment on Heinstrasse in the house of the lawyer Heinrich Friedrich Graf, whose father had been godfather of Anna Magdalena's first son, Gottfried Heinrich. Three children remained in her household after Bach's death. The eldest, unmarried daughter, Katharina Dorothea, from Bach's first marriage, and the two youngest daughters, Johanna Carolina and Regina Susanna, who were 13 and 8 years old. The city council of Leipzig allowed her the guardianship of her children only on the condition that she would not marry again. This sealed their impoverishment. Even the customary entitlement of a widow to half a year's salary was reduced on the grounds that her husband had already received an advanced payment 27 years earlier when he took up his post. However, Anna Magdalena received support from the city of Leipzig and the University of Leipzig, and despite many restrictions, initially belonged to the group of relatively well-off widows. Occasionally, she received special donations and also time support from the state of F. H. Graf, who maintained a foundation for poor widows and students. In total, Anna Magdalena's regular income was one taller a week. That was not a small amount and, for example, corresponded to the income of a guard of the city gates. However, a dramatic decline in her economic situation came with the eruption of the Seven Years' War in 1756. The income from the interest of estates decreased and with it her main source of financial support. Private donations could compensate somewhat for this difference, but steadily decreased during the course of the war. When the former royal court singer passed away on the 27th of February, 1760, as a welfare recipient, a so-called almswoman, the women of the family of the Cantor Bach were already living their lives in bitter poverty. The daughters continued to live as seamstresses on Heinstrasse and later moved into an apartment in the Neukirchhof. And so, Anna Magdalena was given a pauper's burial at the St. John, St. John Cemetery in Leipzig, and, according to what was customary at that time, an unmarked grave. <laughs> 